Hello and welcome to the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. I'm Orlando and we're here today to talk about exciting ingredients, cooking techniques and general kitchen chat. Plus, we have an original Tom Kerridge recipe for you to try out at home, whether you're a beginner or a budding chef. Welcome back to the BBC Good Food podcast. I'm here with Tom and Rosie, and we've got a great subject this week. We're going to talk about steak. Now, Tom, if you could only eat one steak for the rest of your life, what cut of steak would that be? Do you know what? It really is so hard because they're all so amazing. Like, I love a rump steak. Rump steak's great, but you've got to use your teeth. Like, you know, it's a bit (laughs) tricky. But the more you use your teeth, the more flavour there is. It's great. Sirloin, beautiful, great steak. But also, uh, that makes amazing minute steaks. That's really good for quick flash frying. Really good. Fillet steak. I mean, who doesn't love fillet steak? Flavour-wise, not the best, but texturally, it's absolutely delicious. Yeah, people are mean about fillet. They say, oh, it doesn't really taste to anything, but it feels so good. Yeah, exactly. And it does yeah. actually taste of beef, but it's just not very, very strong. If you it? if you roast it, you do a good job of it. You can, you can make fillet taste delicious. I mean, you can make it taste great don't get me wrong you know it's not a bad flavor it's not like is it it, but there are rump steak probably tastes better for me because you do have to chew it a bit more and then ribeye is amazing Mm. a really good ribeye steak because there's two different textures to it there's the eye bit and there's the cat bit over the top and so that so you get so probably i would choose ribeye if i was to have one steak again forever and that would probably be a ribeye steak but that would be torture to you, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would because there's so many of yeah. them. That's the thing. And they're all delicious. Bavette, though, something simple like a yeah. bavette that you, is beautiful, full-flavoured, amazing. Cook, and then you cut it, cut it, slice it against the grain, and then it, textually it's fantastic. There are so many great cuts of meat out there for, for a steak. But yeah, prob- probably ribeye, I think. Why do we all love steak so much? There's something about it, isn't it? Is it the simplicity of it or the the luxury of it? Or For me, I think it's definitely a childhood thing. Again, a, a bit like the roast dinners. Um, it reminds me of being very young on, on, on holiday in France and discovering steak frites. Um, and so whenever I have a steak, that always comes to mind and it's quite a nostalgic thing. It's a real treat. Like I think steak frites was probably one of my first meals out in a restaurant. Um, and that so that has like a kind of real treat label attached to it. Yeah, it is. That. There's something special about it. The fact that it is it does feel like a treat. It's more expensive. It's an expensive cut of, uh, of meat. The, the, just the, through the nature of the process, the, the animal itself takes a lot longer to grow and rear and just everything about it is a bit more specialized and also the cooking process of it you want it medium rare you want it well rested there's something a bit more to it that comes that there's something about steak that but the process of rearing the animal the process of the how many different cuts there are the thing of cooking it the resting it the whole the journey that a steak has to go on before you get to eat it kind of adds little layers of special there's a lot yeah. of love that's gone into that isn't yeah there? on every step of the way and that's what makes it pretty i mean that's what makes it special and we can probably all remember particular steaks that we've eaten in our lives in a particular place which are yes. absolutely outstanding uh, i remember that once being put off an airplane at the wrong airport the plane landed at the wrong airport some catastrophe happened like that and we were all we were all shipped off and we were taken to the local steakhouse it was in the united states and it, I had the most sublime steak of my life there. But I think these circumstances might have made me very relieved to be eating steak. Yeah, yeah. Rather than sat in an airport eating a or being, three-day-old Being in an aeroplane with nowhere to land <laughs> seemed to have been the, the yeah. another possibility. Yeah. I wondered if, they, if it was a bit of a boy thing, a, a steak. But Rosie, if you love it that much, perhaps not. I mean, I'd say I love it. I'd say it isn't something that I have a lot of at all. It's it's not every Saturday night no, you have steak night. No, it's it's quite rare, actually. It's quite a rare thing. It is something that I do tend to order in restaurants, actually, rather than cook at home. Um, and I think it's because I know that if I'm in a really good restaurant, the steak is going to have had... Uh, a lot of love put into the cooking of it but also like we were saying into the whole process Um, and it's a real it's a real special thing and it's also something that I kind of crave with 
uh, really kind of rustling fried frites. And that's, that's, again, something that I'm not really tending to do at home. So it's very much a restaurant experience for me. Yeah, they should be very good at it in a restaurant, shouldn't they? I <laughs> bet you're good at it in your restaurant. Tom. We're all right. We've had steak and chips on the hand of flowers since we've opened. So yeah, it's something that we're very, it, it's something that should be in a pub. Steak, chips, onion rings, perfect. And onion rings always with it. Always with it, yeah. Onion and, rings. And what and what cuts of steak do you offer? We we have fillet. We just we just use fillet steak. We did start with rump steak. We moved to sirloin, but we got too many complaints about people saying that the steak was chewy. And it'd be like, yeah, it's a rump steak, and you just went, so we made the decision that we go well, okay, if people don't want. Because people expect steaks to melt in the mouth, and they don't. The different cuts are di- offer different things, unless so you go, well, all right, let's get fillet steak in, and, you know, we get no complaints. That's it. You know, people are very happy. Texturally, is fine. They also go, you know, they, they come to us, it feels like a special occasion, and fillet steak does say everything about it being a special occasion. So, yeah. so yeah, so no complaints. It's lovely. Fillet steak's on, really aged, marbling, beautiful flavours. That's where we go, and, and it's a great steak. And there's something slightly, well, from one point of view, it's, it's luxurious, but it's also slightly unecological because there aren't that many steaks in an animal. So you end up with a whole load more that, you know, the chuck, there's a whole load of other meat, whereas it's rather select the bits for steak. But that's so, it. That's part of the reason why it's also so expensive as well. If you think there's so only it, there's only two fillets on the whole of a cow. Do you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's a great big beast. You yeah. Know, these two little fillets. But know, I'm, I'm actually really into the cheaper cuts when it comes to steak. So the, what they call the butcher's cuts. So the bavette, it has, like you mentioned, it has so much flavor. It really, you get so much more bang for your buck. A, it's cheaper. And B, it's just, it's really concentrated flavour. So I love to use that and use it sparingly as well. I we it, When I say it's rare for me to have steak at home, I mean in the capacity of sitting down to eat an entire steak. Um, that's something that I do rarely, but I do, I would get a bavette and grill it and then use it as an ingredient, say sliced against the grain very thinly in a kind of salad situation or on tacos or with flatbread, you know, as an ingredient or as a kind of, aspect to a dish rather than it being the main thing. Yeah, and in that case it isn't that crazy because one steak serves three people maybe, yeah. doesn't it? Sliced up. And bavette's really interesting. We're going to come to the different cuts in a moment, but the bavette, uh, if you're lucky enough to see it, it's if if we described it, it's kind of flat cut, isn't it? And a, a thin flat cut. And there's a trick to cooking it, isn't it? Because you don't cook it in, the, in quite the same way as the other steaks. You need to cook it hard and fast. Yeah. And and very hot. Because if you cook it through, it turns it to can, rubber, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it it's got a lot of texture, hasn't it? So yeah, it, it can it, become very mouth you It's know, texture chewy. euphemism for, for um, gristle or something. No, no, <laughs> just because of the nature of it, the way that it, it works. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's not... Um, it's it's not got a higher fat content, and just because of the uh, part of the muscle that it is, it's a working muscle rather than a, like a fillet steak. Fillets are always so soft texturally because they don't, they do, don't anything. do anything. Yeah, they don't. They don't. They're just carried around. Yeah. So so actually, you know, so when you come to bits of steak that are part of the muscle and the animal's movement and and structure, that's the those are the bits that need that little bit either more cooking so it becomes a braising cut mm. or. Very quick cooking, taken off and rested, and you don't want to cook it any more than medium, any more than medium at all on a bavette. Otherwise, it it does become difficult to eat. Yeah, it becomes chewy. It becomes chewy. It's and like, it's good on a griddle, isn't it? Because or a barbecue. Or, yeah. 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 Hot though, not like a not like a slower barbecue where where you know like a barbecue like most people have where it's too hot where you burn a sausage on the outside it's yeah. raw in the middle that's what you want for bavette not yeah. a sausage slower for a, <laughs> slower for a sausage hot, hot for, for a bavette, bavette. <laughs> and there's also something in the slicing of the steak that's important because a bavette you would never serve without slicing it up really thinly and you do that against the grain don't you yeah. so, so that the the muscles are running a, 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 in the opposite direction it's very hard to slice it with the grain because it, you, it sort it of would catch would yeah, it? Well, yeah. It's, yeah it's kind yeah. of a hard motion whereas if you're slicing it against the grain you can slice through it but, but, whereas if you try and slice it with the grain the whole steak's moving with the knife it's actually rather nice to serve steak sliced up anyway, isn't it? In the, in the recipe that we're going to taste in a moment, Lucky Us, which is from the website, which is a uh, ribeye steak. Um, Tom, you slice that up and um, it's... 
I don't know. It, it, it isn't that one's too lazy to slice one's own meat, but it somehow makes it more delicious. Feels to... a bit more presented. That's those sort yeah. of things. And it feels, and it feels. I mean, it goes. It feels like it's going much further as well. You know, it feels like you're getting more for. You know, it makes something feel special. And also, if you've cooked it beautifully and perfectly, you want to show off that it's nice and pink in the middle. Yeah, that's good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing that with pork chops recently, cutting them off the bone and slicing them thinly, mm. and they they look much. More special than the old pork chop used to do. Just a bit of presentation, isn't it? It's yeah. the same thing. Although the fillet steak we serve, we serve as a single thing, so we're allowing everybody else to cut them at the restaurant. So it depends on the cut. It really does. And if you can be bothered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, where are we on the different breeds of beef? Because you, the, you, they're very interested butchers now in telling you what what sort of animal that was whether it was an Aberdeen Angus or a Dexter or something like that um it's obviously it does make a lot of difference but Tom do you do you seek out certain breeds or is it no and I tell you why it it comes back to my conversations that I have with suppliers and it comes down to the with the butcher talking to the butcher about what is the best right now what have you got is the best right now and it, whether it's a dexter whether it's an H- angus or hereford cross whether it what whether it's a limousan beef whether whatever it is it's what is the best that's that you have right now that's been hanging for the longest got the best marbling got the way because there's no point in saying i just want dexter beef but if the dexter cattle that have come in the marbling's not quite right or they've not been hanging for long enough or the flavor there's no point in taking those if next to them there's a crossbreed of beef that's got better flavor got better I I work with supplier going, let me have the best that you've got. Yeah, I can never understand this because you're expecting the butcher to be able to tell you about the meat. Now, I know that he knows about butchering. It's his job and he knows about animals, things like that. But how does he know how it's going to cook up? I mean, he's not, he's not testing it in his kitchen. He's not no, trying you can, bits of steak out. But you Some can butchers tell, do, though. Yeah, but, and you can tell from raw products whether so it's got high tell. marbling or whether it'll cook well or whether it'll caramelise nicely. You can tell what you can tell whether an animal's, animal's been stressed under slaughter. You can tell. But so he colour, can tell you, all that. The butcher can tell you. Can I just say, we're saying he. There are some really fantastic female butchers out oh, there. Very true. There is fantastic. an incredible... Yeah, my, the butcher I use in Deal is called Lizzie. She's at the Black Pig and she... Is is just a dream. She is an absolute dream for any home cook or any chef. She works with local farmers. She gets half a cow in every fortnight and butchers it all herself. She ages everything beautifully um, and she's absolutely amazing. So we mustn't forget there are some really oh, good Oh, I'm really butchers. pleased to hear it. I, uh, there's, there's actually a, a girl fishmonger in Taunton as well. So things are things are looking up. But um, I'm really interested that the, that the butchers, whether he's or she butchers, um, that they uh, it's part of their craft if they're doing it right to be able to tell whether an animal is going to cook up well definitely good i think it's knowing your product yeah yeah, and there's there's an incredible butcher in um cornwall in launston called warrens which um a lot of top chefs are using um in in london and the rest of the country now and they they go above and beyond so they actually um go as far as to work with the farmers um not only in selecting which which um kind of breeds of cattle that they're rearing for flavor for different flavor purposes but also um what the cattle are fed on and how they're finished so um they take them to finish them on pasture and then at the butcher they have these incredible chambers where they dry age them using these really big um, blocks of Himalayan salt. Yeah, the and pink, pink bricks. Yeah, and, and what they know about meat is, is you know, they are actually educating chefs that work with them about the meat and about the ageing process and they really are experts in their field. That's that's Warren's in Cornwall. Yeah. Well, that's worth watching out for because I don't think I don't think I can learn myself what a really delicious piece of, piece of meat is going to how to choose a, a particular steak. Maybe if I'd been you know trained I tell as you a what, butcher. I bet you if we put four raw steaks in front of you, one that was really one that was really good, one that wasn't so great, where you would be able to you would just instinctively know 
which one is going to cook up well, beautifully. Well, if it's bright red and has that kind of luminous red thing, I think that's a mistake when it's too bright red. Yeah, highly likely that was an animal that was stressed during if, slaughter. Really? Mm. If it if it's uh, got no fat in it, I wouldn't go for that one because I think it needs some marbling through the meat. There you go. See, you're already, no, you're already, <laughs> you're already going, okay. But so. you're, you're, Tom, at your restaurant, you're a different level from me, aren't you? You're, you're seeking the best of the best. Yeah, but it's only, but you don't, so you still understand So would you be looking for slightly it? yellow fat? or anything like that? Uh, no. no, no? I, I, you're just looking for fat content. Yellow fat probably means that it's, it's been fed, yeah, it's corn fed or maize fed or maize finished. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a big difference. That's another big thing as well between where, where you were talking about the best steak you had in, was in the USA. However, that piece of meat was probably maize or corn finished. So it was a high fat content. So texturally, I'm sure it was great. But flavor wise, Grass-fed, completely grass-fed British beef is fantastic. So, you know, that, those are the differences. It just, that, I mean, that, that's super fine detail, but you can tell texturally difference and flavour-wise, you can tell difference between grass-fed and maize-fed. It's a bit like what we were talking about with cheese. You know, these things make a huge difference, don't they? What the, what the animal's been finished or been feeding on. Um, and the grass-fed meat is is so, so much nicer. And the ageing, that's really important. Obviously, you have to trust the butcher that they've done, the number of days that they've said they've done. But is there a, a kind of a, a, a good number of days to aim for? Or is 21, it... 28 days, and anything more than that, and it becomes... Well, anything more than that, all you're doing is almost dehydrating the meat. It, it, what it does is kind of intensifies the flavour, but you, it, it's shrinking. What you're doing is eradicating... Mo it, moisture is evaporating. So basically, as it's, it's shrinking down... But the outside of it, you probably need to cut off anyway. So you'll just you you'll gain a touch of flavour, but you're actually losing moisture and texture. So so for for me, twenty eight days is absolutely fine, and most most butchers do twenty one to twenty eight days. Yeah, there are some restaurants really going for it though with the whole aging thing and with kind of playing around with the blue cheese, the umami flavours that develop on those really really heavily aged um, animals. So there's a restaurant in Cumbria called the Lake Road Kitchen where they age their steaks for 90 to 100 days um, and they call it controlled decomposition um, and really it's not just the loss of moisture but the, the meat is actually starting to to decompose slightly so there's a change in the flavour um, uh, and in the texture. I'm feeling very uncomfortable about this. <laughs> it I sounds disgusting but actually don't fancy they, this at all. it's it's you know, it is something that there's a lot of people who have got time for that and who want to taste those flavours in their meat. Personally, it's, it's a very distinct flavour having meat that's been aged that long. It isn't the sort of steak funky, that you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't just go out on a Saturday night going, I'm going to have a steak. This is quite a <laughs> specialist thing that you'd eat probably once, maybe twice a year yeah. and go, you know, it was a big power. It's good. It, that's something then goes beyond eating a steak. That becomes entering into another realm of that. It's almost like eating game in the 80s or early mm. 90s where it was big and strong and flavour. And it wasn't about it being, it's a different level of food understanding there. It's not just going, do you know what? I fancy steak and chips. That's yeah. like going, yeah. I go for something quite specialist. It's here. quite an extreme. Yeah. And it's it's all about those other more interesting flavours, isn't it? It's a whole yeah, other thing. It's, but it is great. It's, it tastes fantastic. But it's no, you, if you're going looking for a steak, you'll come away disappointed. If you're going for looking for an amazing flavour explosion, then it's something completely different. Full on beefiness, like yeah. big, strong, gamey flavours. It's looking for something different. I met a surgeon once who had uh, who was very keen amateur to cook, and he found a recipe, a Heston recipe for a uh, beef that was cooked in incredibly low temperature for twenty four hours, and he got it out all excited and kind of looked at it, and he drew a breath, and he he kind of went went pale, and he said that is the smell of gangrene. Um, so he didn't enjoy that. That was probably what this uh, controlled decomposition smells a bit like. See, that, that comes from when you're cooking things at a low temperature. And it wasn't correct in the first place. So this is buying the correct produce because then if you're going to cook something that's low and slow at a very low temperature, it has to have been bacteria free. It has to be, it has to be correct in the first place before you put it in a vacuum sealed bag and cook it at a low temperature. He wouldn't have had that piece of meat. There may have been something, an issue, and then it's just then cooked at a low temperature and festered even more. <laughs> yeah. there, is, there is nothing wrong with cooking something at a lower temperature if you have all the scientific and critical control points put in there like Heston does.
Um, can we talk about something more cheerful? <laughs> How about um, Wagyu beef? Um, is that the same as Kobe beef? And have I said those two words right? Because you I read them, them more both, than say them. You know, you've said Wagyu them both. Kobe. Are they the same thing? Yeah, Kobe is a region of Japan where Wagyu beef will come from. So, so Wagyu beef is a style of Japanese beef that is... Um, uh, has uh, a grading system put in place that's high fat content that's but um i mean drinks beer eats and, maize and, and is massaged and looked at and completely has this wonderful tranquil life that is but it's all about fat content and uh, and it's you have to cook it to medium maybe medium rare at the most because you have to cook it to the point where the fat dissolves because mm -hmm. otherwise it's it's too fatty. It needs to be, it becomes very buttery, has such a high fat content and is amazing. The is it Japanese, like foie gras in a, in a sense? Yeah, it's maybe not quite fat. that fatty. I mean, foie gras <laughs> but, is like 90% fat. However, <laughs> it's a it, super fatty beef. It needs to be looked after because it's, the way that the Japanese cook beef is very different to the way that we cook beef. So in the UK, we we sear things up. We like it on a char grilled or barbecued or, or uh, heavily roasted or, or the, whereas the Japanese a lot of people in their own homes don't even have ovens or or space ki big functional kitchens because space is a premium. For example, in Tokyo, in the center of Tokyo, most people have a very, very tiny hob with a pot where they might just have some stock that bubbles away. And the last minute, they'll put in some very thinly sliced beef and stir it in and serve it. At that point, that's where the beef kind of dissolves and it's got this lovely... So they don't necessarily have steaks where it's seared up as steak. So it's a very different breeding process for a de very different cooking method. But it has... It's all about texture with Wagyu beef. It's all about texture. What about Wangus? Yeah, amazing. So that's a cross between um, Wagyu beef and Aberdeen Angus. So there's a breeder that's based up in Scotland, just outside Edinburgh. Is that the best of both worlds? It's amazing. It roasts beautifully. It has this fantastic grass-fed flavour of British beef, but then it has this, because it's it's bred with Wagyu, uh, like um, sired with um, a, amazing uh, A-graded Wagyu beef that it has this fat content that's amazing. So texturally, it's fantastic. Flavor-wise, it's beautiful. Cost-wise, I mean, you know, it's um, it's, it's, it's up there. <laughs> Does that do, do they drink beer up there and listen to the radio as well? They have a massage. They they they're well looked after in some very quiet, beautiful rolling countryside in the Highlands. I so want to be reborn as one of these. Well, yeah, at some point you do get slaughtered and eaten. Yeah, so yeah, but, I mean, as a <laughs> at some point it does come to an end. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still to come on BBC Good Foods podcast with Tom Kerridge. We're always interested in your in your health and how you keep it and, and keep yourself looking great. Is steak part of your normal diet or is it a special occasion thing not, for you? Uh, not now. I've changed the way that I eat a little bit. Um, uh, and so steak doesn't play a part as much, uh, but I, I'd love it to. However, I've swapped steak for baked potatoes. So right now it's, you know... Is it is it a fair swap? I don't know. It, <laughs> well, it's not entirely not. suffering, it's a lot cheaper. is it? Yeah. <laughs> a good baked potato is excellent with steak. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to have a lot of butter on there, Tom. Yeah, very true. Um, Tom, do you cook the different cuts different ways? I mean, Bavette, we've talked about that Bavette gets hurled into very hot pans. So we, what about the rump and the sirloin and the rib ribeye? No, I'd cook them all the same way. But they've which, got to be which is, which is how uh, in hard and fast in a pan with oil and butter, plenty of salt and pepper, and, and sear that. And the butter goes into the pan and caramelizes and browns, and then you sear it up very, very hard and fast and heavy, like almost charred crisped up then taken out and rested at like simple as that simple as that but it's got to be a thick cut you can't do it. it's quite often people buy steaks that are too thin and then they try grilling them and by the time they've got any color on them they've just overcooked them They're so stewed. are we talking like three centimeters thick sort of thing an inch yeah, in old money? Yeah, yeah. yeah, an inch or even yeah, inch yeah. and a half, like a nice thick steak. And, then, and you baste it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the yeah, butter. Baste it. Quite a lot of butter, butter and oil. And the, a lot of butter and oil. Oh, lemon plenty. juice, yeah. And then lemon juice at the end. Keep basting it flavours. Chuck in some of Rose's garlic that she's brought in. Throw in some thyme. Like, just constantly baste it, baste it, baste it. Take it off and rest it. And the resting process is really important. And the resting for how long? 
15 minutes. Yeah. And the seasoning, do you do that in advance or before it goes in the pan or afterwards? Or in advance, it? in advance. And so uh, salt, not with pepper, actually. So just salt. So season, heavy season with salt, uh, probably 10 minutes before cooking. And what the salt does is it helps to draw moisture. So the moisture comes from the steak. That means that when you put it into the pan, you've got this, it gives it a really nice crust. It's a way of getting a nice crust and see it. I like this crust on an outside of a steak. Yeah. So it's so you've got this crispy outside. And then when you cut in the middle, you've got this gorgeous, soft, lovely center. Do you do around the edges as well? All the, the way around the so, edges. So Everything. you kind of roll it, roll it round. Yeah, this isn't something that you can just like put in a pan and go and watch the telly you've got to you you are cooking state you cook got to give it some love yeah and you do you can do several at once though can't you in i can yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i can i've done many a year on the sauce section which is the meat and fish so yeah you so spend... if they're in a in a normal in a home kitchen if there were two or four of you you could fit them in the pan and do them all at once you could you? yeah and, and then you'd have to put your oven on 50 degrees centigrade and when they're all seared up and taken out you could put them into the oven and sit them at 50 degrees and 50 that degrees centigrade and that just right. sits there as a resting and holding oven it will sit there it won't go cold and it will just yeah for 15 20 minutes fantastic i want to ask you about the pan sauce in a moment because we've had someone from instagram who, who wanted to know about pan sauce but just before i do that um how do you know when it's cooked to Practice. your liking Practice. Practice. Oh, that's so helpful. Rosie, isn't that just, because, doesn't that solve all our problems? Well, I tell gonna... you what, it is. That's the only way of saying it. Because you know that thing where people say... But Rosie but... doesn't even cook a steak very often. She only cooks one once in a blue moon. She's never going to get enough practice to get it right. How often really practice? Like, yeah, I think it's about feeling your way with it, isn't it? And and there is that whole um, hand... It's quite a good uh, me methodology, the hand thing. So if it's um, if you clench together your if you make a fist with your thumb tucked under your fingers, if you if you hold it quite tensely and tap on that muscle there, if that's very tense, <laughs> this is, I should explain to those listening. This is you. You need to be watching this, but there is a video on the Good Food website, yeah, so, so you can see someone's hand and what it's meant to be look like, looking like, because you're you're kind of making a fist and poking different parts of your hand. Yeah, definitely, and and it's about texture and it's how you like it done personally. So if you like your steak super rare, then if you touch it in the pan and it feels soft once it's got a nice caramelized char on it, you know that you need to take it out of the pan and rest it, otherwise it's going to go over. If you like it more medium rare, then you want it a bit firmer and it's about touching it isn't it and listening to it's it it's all about touch listen, and feel listen, that to, thing thing to it. now i'm really losing you what does it what does it sing a song when it's ready well it Rosie? should make a lovely noise when it goes in the pan so it should sizzle really really sizzle <laughs> And then, you know, it should develop that nice caramelization on yeah. the outside. Um, and then, yeah, just keep kind of touching it, keep an eye on it, um, and then know when to take it out and rest it. And do you touch it in the middle or on the around? In, I, yeah, I'd, I'd go for it like. Yeah, in the, yeah, or like, try it in a in few the, different places. You want to go in the middle because that's where. That's where that's the your heat hand. needs that's to go. That's not the steak. So that would be the steak that you're touching. Yeah. So I'm touching oh, in the God, middle. In the middle of the steak. I see how confusing is all this. This is why it's all about practice. The hand thing I just find ridiculous. That just everything about it is like th th because a steak, each cut of meat. It's, it's like human beings. We're all different. We all have different muscle breakdown. We all have different water content in us. We all have different. We're all different. So a steak is exactly the same. They're all different. And the only way you get to learn to cook the most beautiful steaks is by doing them and practicing them again and again. And then that way you'll know each time. Okay, you I've look got this. by the way it handles and yeah. by, the, by how yeah. floppy it is, it that really, sort of thing. Like something like a bavette or an onglet is going to be more wobbly even when it's cooked it's it so the hand test doesn't work on a cart like that because right. of, because of the texture of the meat <laughs> it's, well, get cooking steaks mate you gotta be cooking tense so the guy what about my digital thermometer will that help yeah that would help okay because you as medium as rare thick, is around yeah. about 56 degrees but again you're cooking that in a in a hot pan so you're going to really want to take it out when it's in the middle around about 40 45 degrees leaving it to rest so the residual heat yeah. continues to cook it yeah so it, it is it's but again that will come from practice because you don't know when to, depending on the thickness when do i take it out the pan you know all of those sort of it is all practice with steak the other alternative is don't cook steak Go out to a restaurant, a good one, and order steak and let somebody who's practicing <laughs> it do it for you. <laughs> well, I, I 
wish that I could, it, or I wished it always arrived the way that I would like it to because it doesn't always, it can be disappointing. Well, that's, and the how, disappointing that's how difficult is, it is. These are chefs disappointing that cooking. Disappointing steak is a shame, isn't it? Definitely, think, and it's such a waste because it's like, as we've been saying, as we've been touching on, it's such a, um, you know, there's so much work that goes into making a, a steak and making a cow. Um, and yeah, it's a shame to waste it. Um, into so, making, making a cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what did so, you do with it? I made a cow. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tom, I've got this pan with the, uh, the steak is now resting in the 50 degree oven. I've got this lovely oil and uh, caramelized butter in there. Um, I'd now like to make a quick pan sauce just to, uh, just to finish off. How can I do that? Okay, pour most of the oil away, like most of it. Can then. I reuse that? No. No, pour that way. Okay. No, pour it away. Get rid of it. Then into that you put some chopped shallots, which are lovely, like so sweet, not onions. You want to use shallots, okay? Throw them into the pan. Some thyme leaves, a bit of garlic. Cook them out. Soften them up. Pour in a bit, a, a big splash of red wine. Reduce it down. Glaze it. Maybe a little spoonful of red currant, currant jelly if you wanted to. Little splash of red wine vinegar. Beef stock, bring it up to the boil, reduce it down, splash of cream, take it off, throw in a knob of butter, stir it around, pass it through a sieve, pour it on your steak. That was amazing. Well, that was a performance. You, you, know, you and could if do you that want, on stage, If Tom. you want, you could put, throw in some cracked black pepper or some, like, you can get lovely little green peppercorns that are in brine oh, yes. and they're amazing. Throw them in, a beautiful peppercorn sauce. A little stir of Dijon mustard into it. All those sort of things. They just keep adding layers of flavours if you want. You know, and just and then, taste it a few times and zhuzh it up. Yeah, towards, don't forget towards salt in. into it because salt's really important for making everything come to life. Yeah, we've talked about salt before. You, you're a, a heavy user of salt, I aren't am, you, yeah. Tom? Yeah. yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I, it, it's one of those things that if you come to the Hand of Flowers, you're not eating there every day. And we're all about driving the flavor forward, flavor, flavor, flavor. And salt enhances flavors. And it is, listen, as a, as a salt content, it's, it's higher than probably most dishes would recommend or most like against NHS guidelines. However, you're not over a week it's balanced out if you eat the hand of flour what it is is about just driving the flavours and making it so important as tasty and super special An under seasoned steak is a real crime it really is it's such a waste under seasoned anything under seasoned anything yeah. you want things to taste of what they're supposed to taste of all the time it's about flavour we're living in a world of food this is a food podcast this is about what it should taste like this isn't the health podcast yeah. like if it was I wouldn't be sat here <laughs> we're here about what the things taste like how do we make them lovely salt seasoning is all about flavor yeah but you're you've got a great health story tom and we're always interested in your in your health and how you keep it and and keep yourself looking great is steak part of your normal diet or is it a special occasion thing not for you? Uh, not now i've changed the way that i eat a little bit um it used to be huge yeah i went through a period of being low Mr. carb steak, hydrate. yeah well i went through low oh, low right. carb so i got rid of it so protein was i was heavy on protein um and so steak was a huge part of it yeah steak chicken that sort of stuff now it's slightly different i'm on a lower calorie control thing because i'm trying to do a different idea um and so steak doesn't play a part as much uh but i i'd love it to however i've swapped steak for baked potatoes so right now it's you know is it is it a fair swap? I don't know. <laughs> it, well, it's not entirely not. suffering. It's a lot cheaper. Is it? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a good baked potato is excellent with steak. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to have a lot of butter on there, Tom. Yeah, very true. And the minute it's baked potatoes and cottage cheese, Rosie. That makes me very sad. No, it's delicious. Do you not like cottage cheese? Everyone goes, like oh, cottage cheese. cheese. I like the feel of it. It's great. It's amazing oh, invention. No. Who invented it? Because it's an amazing sort of shreddy thing. Nothing, yeah. nothing else is like that in the mouth, is well, it? Well, there's a few things that are like that, but I don't want to eat them. <laughs> What about the other sauces, Tom? Do you have a, um, a, a other favourites like um, peppercorn or blue cheese or bearnaise? Blue, we can go all classic if you oh, like. Oh, bearnaise is amazing. A good. Do you serve that in the restaurant? Yeah, yeah. Steak. So chips, you've got bernays, some guy so whipping up the bearnaise yeah, every make, every time it gets asked for. No, 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 no. We make it. We make it per service. We make it each service right. and then hold it in a hold it at temperature. Right. So it's yeah. So we we make we make bernays yeah every, twice at least twice a day and we make loads of it and it's lush. I love it. Big strong. You want a base of acidity of shallots with white wine, white wine vinegar, tarragon, peppercorns, all of those sort of things and the big flavors. So it's not just just this kind of like 
a rich buttery sauce through it you've got the counterbalance we you finish it with cabernet sauvignon vinegar lemon juice salt like so it all really pungenty and then loads and loads of chopped tarragon yeah that sounds so good yeah. a really good thing for home cooks if they're having steak night is to make a kind of compound butter so rather than having to muck around after you've been cooking the steak and that's quite we've established that's quite stressful and takes a lot of practice but yeah you need to be an octopus don't you yeah. you've got this hand here worrying about the oven you've got this one here doing that you've got to that. make a salad or make yeah. the chips but yeah. you could make a nice butter ahead of time um, you know with shallots and like you say tarragon a bit of vinegar maybe a bit of mustard or you could do a blue cheese one like we were talking about stilton that's lovely with steak um, and then just slice a disc of it and put it on top of the the warm steak and let it melt down into the steak and that, that's really that's delicious. That's the next best thing really after bayonets isn't it because it's the butteriness without the difficulty of making and it. also those butters that rose mentioned that you can keep in the freezer so they work really well if you make a batch if you get a couple of packs of butter beat them together with all the flavors and then roll them into like in little cling from things as sausages yeah. and stick them in the freezer they, they're 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 great and you use them bit by bit there's no problem there i think people are understandably worried about making a bearnaise sauce because it can of course split yeah and if it does it's a bit tragic i mean i've i had an ice cube which a small ice cube usually <laughs> saves the and gives you another life but um otherwise it's horrible you can't really serve it it's very it's, uh... difficult yeah it's, it's one of those like mayonnaise is i mean mayonnaise is relatively hard to make i suppose if you're not practicing the understanding of how to emulsify it and then bernays is next level because it's the same sort of emulsification but it now has temperature involved with it yeah. as well that you've got to have things at the same so they are steak bernays and chips right Sounds like the simplest of things, but to get right and perfect every time is so, it's technically incredibly difficult. It's a lovely challenge for a passionate home cook. I'd say yeah. it's one of those things that you tackle head on and you want, if you want to have a go at making bernets, well, that is going to be fun. It is challenging, but there's, you can get so far with a very, very good steak, a really good quality shop bought bernets. You know, you, you can take shortcuts if, you, if you're not up for the challenge. And a baked potato instead of the chips. Yeah, we can no. get around this. You it has to be chips. chips. I still want. If I'm having bernets, I want chips to dip in it. Um, we should probably have some to eat at this point. I think we've got we've got a very nice recipe. We've got a Tom Kerridge recipe from the Good Food website. Is it steak? It's of course it's steak. <laughs> it's I hope there's no steak. cottage cheese. And it's really clever. It's all done in one pan. So it's um, with potatoes oh, and wow. peas. And you've got Ooh, something radishes. in... Exactly, radishes. Well, it's so nice to see a, a radish. See, let's slice steak. How great does that look? Nice and pink in the middle. That looks excellent. Absolutely perfect. And if I can return to these radishes, because I, we never see radishes, and here we've got these radishes in this. This is a clever vegetable dish of potatoes, and radishes and peas and it was cooked in the pan while the steak was resting i love a radish there's something so beautiful they're peppery they're strong mm. they're delicious they're and you cook them or, or do you like them raw as well as cooked? both raw oh. and cooked they're, they're, they're amazing cooked. yeah they're so so good i love radishes they're just they're just brilliant um, while we're enjoying that, uh, blue cheese sauce, is that something that you're you're keen on? Or do you think that's a bit overpowering for a steak? Well, Tom. I think I think it goes well with a steak, but it is quite overpowering. If you like those big, strong flavours, it's it's good. It, it, you know, steaks are robust, they're big stuff, they they can they can they can hold a big flavour. Yes, the blue cheese becomes quite prominent. It and ends dominant. up being a bit of a blue cheese fest if you're not it, careful. It doesn't does, it? yeah. Go careful with it. But at the same point. It's not like it's something that's super subtle that, you know, you're going to lose everything. It is When you eat a, a steak like that, it is about robust flavours. And, you know, blue cheese that goes with it is, is absolutely fine. It's, it wouldn't be my first choice of actual ch sauce to go with it. But if it came with it, if I was someone else, I, yeah, I'd quite, mm. quite happily have it. Now, we're running out of time, so I just wanted to ask you one quick question. There are these um, funny steaks now coming in, like like tomahawk steaks and T-bone steaks. I know T-bone steaks have been in the States for a while. Are they just a gimmick? They're very, very big. No, T-bones are amazing. So T-bone... T-bone's mm, huge, though, isn't it? Yeah, but, yeah, but, well, yeah, you want it nice and thick, but what it is, that's the best of both worlds. So that's fillet. And the sirloin, so it's where it's where the actual rib cage is, and it's the bit of it's both sides. The it's the right. cut. So the sirloin is on the outside of the animal, and the fillet is on the inside of the animal, and it's cut through the middle. So you've got um, uh, you've got both steaks on the bone. You have to roast it on the bone so that they don't shrink up, and it's fantastic. When you say roast, do you do that in the oven? That 
No, no you, in the you, pan. In the pan. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's cooked on the bone. So it's amazing. Tomahawk. I mean, but, uh, to be now, honest, is that a, a, that's a rib. That's a rib of some kind. It is, it's, it's a like rib. A rib. It, it's a coke de beurre. It's a rib by steak. Just the bone is a lot longer, which looks amazing. Served in a brilliant steakhouse restaurant in the middle of Mayfair. Amazing at home. You ain't got a pan to get that in. It's not big enough. Don't bother getting one of those. All you're buying, all you're buying is extra long bone. Right. Pointless. Good if you've got a dog. It is good if you've got a dog that likes beef bones. Yeah. Don't have two dogs because they'll fight over it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I've got a whole load of inspiration for my next steak night. Radishes. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I've got to be keep practising, so I'll do that. Thank you very much, Rosie and Tom. Pleasure. Pleasure. See you next week. Thank you for listening to today's show. You'll find the recipe and thousands more on bbcgoodfood.com. If you have a minute, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at BBC Good Food. <laughs>